I want you to imagine for a moment, how many of you guys are list makers? Any list makers? Uh, calendar appointment keepers. Uh, let me see you guys. How many of you guys are the type of people that you just hope it happens? Any of you guys are just like, yeah, okay. All right, so I'm talking to the calendar keepers for just a moment. Just imagine with me, all of you, because for me, if it's on my list, it gets done. If it's on my calendar, I, I'm there. So those of you guys who are calendar keepers, imagine for a moment that you have an appointment on your calendar, and it is with the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Two weeks from today, like you have an appointment set, and you're going to meet face-to-face. You're going to probably meet at a fancy restaurant or something like that. How many of you guys would wash your car that day? Anybody? Just like, how many... I imagine a lot of us, what would happen is we would end up, between now and then, we might rearrange some of our life. I don't know. I, you, you might look at how you're spending your money and like, okay, I, I want to kind of organize some things. Maybe our habits would change even just in that two-week period. Anybody? I mean, for two weeks, we might you know, stop watching as much Netflix or whatever it is you do. But Why? We would probably try to just white knuckle, you know, that that you know problem that we've been trying to face. We'd white knuckle it and try to not do that thing, whatever it is, for the next two weeks. Why? Because we don't want to show up, you know, before the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, unprepared or embarrassed or you know, with with a, a situation in our life that was untaken care of. How many guys for two weeks you would just, I mean, just make it happen, right? But what if you didn't have the opportunity? What if it wasn't on your calendar? What if it happened? What if that appointment showed up at a time that you were not expecting? Let me go even further. What if that appointment, what if you met the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords? What if you came and met Jesus like in your worst moment? Like in the moment of your worst secret sin, like right in that moment. That would not be a fun day, would it, right? That would not be a fun moment. Can I just tell you that every single one of us have already met Jesus at our worst moment? Because there's nothing hidden from God. And so whether you realize it or not, you have already met the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords at your worst moment, at your most unprepared moment. And so I want you to think about whatever chains you might have. A lot of people, we have chains on the inside. We don't want to admit it. But we have some sort of thing that is nagging at us. Maybe it's, you know, I'm not going to list a whole bunch. You you know what those things are, those things that we're struggling to break free from. Those things that if we had the opportunity uh, to set an appointment to meet Jesus, we would try to change before them, like that thing. That, That thing, whatever it is that you would not want to be caught in or stuck in or staying in if you could get out of it before you met Jesus. But Whatever those things are, I want to do something today. I want, to, um, I want you to understand that you can be free today because there's freedom in Jesus. But, but here's what I want you to understand right, right out of the, the gate here. You don't have to be free already to qualify for freedom. Let that set in for just a second. You're not, your freedom doesn't qualify you for freedom. A lot of us, we try to get free, try to clean up before we can experience freedom. That's not how freedom happens. And so I want to give you some thoughts on freedom today since Jesus is the ultimate freedom giver. And this is a day that represents freedom that comes in Christ. I want you to first understand this, that freedom is an inside job. If you're going to experience freedom in your life, it happens from the inside out. And I want you to think about this in any area of your life that you want to experience freedom, any area that you're struggling, any area that you're stuck in, any area that there's a problem, it's going, you're going to experience freedom on the inside before you will ever experience an external freedom. But so many of us, we focus on the external, we try to fix the external when freedom is what happens on the inside from the inside out. And this is what happened on that day when Jesus, or on that weekend that we're celebrating right now, where Jesus was died, buried, and raised from the dead. Matthew chapter 27, verse 51. And behold, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. How many of you guys were with us Friday night at our Good Friday service? Wasn't that awesome? It was packed out, had to use auditorium too. But we talked about this temple, this curtain in the temple was torn top to bottom. That was very significant. It opened up the way to the presence of God. And this happened, and the earth shook. So there was an earthquake. The rocks were split, 
And the tombs, most people don't catch this part, but the tombs were opened and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised and coming out of the tombs after the resurrection, they went into this holy city and appeared to many. So what happened as Jesus went into the tomb, what happened? Freedom was starting to happen from the inside out. But I want you to understand from the outside, everyone thought that that day was like the worst day, I mean, in history. The dark, we said the darkest day. So on what looked like the darkest day, the most freedom that has ever happened in all of human history happened at a time when it looked like the darkest day in all of human history. And so I want you to be encouraged today that no matter what is happening on the outside in your life right now, and it may look dark, and it may look like it's an impossibility, but I want you to understand that even in those situations that freedom can happen. And it ties right in, because if you're with us, Week to week, you know we're going through the book of Acts, and it ties right into our story in Acts chapter 16. There's so many similarities from the resurrection and the, the tomb and the crucifixion to the story that we've come across in Acts 16. In Acts 16, we see a couple disciples, Paul and, and Silas, and they're preaching this good news I'm talking about. But because of preaching it, they get thrown into prison. And as they're thrown into prison... Let's look what happens here. It says in Acts 16, 23. And when they inflicted many blows upon them, they threw them into prison, ordering the jailer to keep them safely. Having received this order, he put them into the inner prison and fastened their feet in the stocks. This is like their version of going into the tomb, right? I mean, they're in the inner, inner prison, got chains on. This is what we call in the Greek, this is called a bad day. That's what that is called in the original language. And it looked like it was all over, right? It looked like it was all over except for somebody needing to sing. You know what I'm talking about, right? And in this case, somebody does start to sing. I don't know which one it was. I don't know if it's Paul or Silas, but one of them looked over to the other. You know, maybe Silas looked over to Paul and said, hey, Paul, we're sitting here. It's midnight. We're stuck. Like, this is our worst day ever. You know, this is a really bad day. But you remember that, that album that came out from the church in Corinth, you know, like track two? Like, let's sing that one right now. And so they just start singing the song, and about verse 25, about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. And we'll see very quickly that an earthquake happened. Can you see all the similarities starting to happen between the tomb and this tomb that they find themselves in? But what happens is, there they are at midnight in the tomb. Worst day probably ever, one of their worst days ever. They're there, and it all looks as dark as it's going to be. It looks like the end has come, and yet they're singing. Why are they singing? They're singing because they understand this truth, that no matter what's happening externally, you can, it can look like a prison on the outside, but you can be walking in freedom on the inside. I, I, have you guys follow Pastor Robert Morris? Some of you guys follow Pastor Robert Morris. I saw a clip from him this week where he was actually talking about a hymn, an old hymn that represents somebody who had had a dark, dark day and yet began to experience this freedom. What's cool is he shares a story from the garden tomb. Let's take a quick look at this video. This morning, I just woke up with a, a, an old hymn on my heart, and uh, I'm not going to sing it or lead it, but I'm going to just give you a little history behind it. I, I like to read history behind hymns. And so before I actually give you the hymn that's on my heart, I'll give you a little history of something you saw yesterday. And you may know this, but in the uh, Friends of Zion Museum, we saw H.G. Uh, Spafford, who was a great friend of Israel and did a lot for the nation of Israel. H.G. Spafford was an attorney and a developer in the city of Chicago. And uh, God had blessed him. He's a very devout believer. When he, his son, though, he had four daughters and one son. When his son was two years old, his son died. Uh, right after his son died, the uh, fire of Chicago came, basically wiped him out financially. He had another business still going in England. And so he sent his wife and four daughters ahead of him while he wrapped up some things and then the ship sank, and his uh, wife sent back a very famous telegraph. Now, 
uh, saved alone. So his four daughters had died as well. So they, they lost their son. They lost all their possessions, in essence, all his investments, and then lost four daughters and uh, all their children. And uh, so he got on a ship immediately to go be with his wife. And on the way over, he asked the captain, please let me know the area where the ship sank where I lost my daughters. And so he woke him up about two o'clock in the morning and they went up on the deck and he was standing there on the deck. The captain then said, if you want a moment alone, you know, and he left standing there on the deck and uh, he wrote these words, when peace like a river attendeth my way. And then here's where the people never get this, when sorrows like sea billows roll. Whatever my lot thou hast taught me to say, it is well with my soul. So he's writing that at the place where his daughters drowned. And he talks about when sorrows like sea billows roll. And he's looking at the sea, sea billows, you know. So this is the, the hymn that I wrote, woke up with this morning. Somehow we just don't catch everything that it says. It's so deep. So this guy was getting free on the outside or on the inside, no matter what was happening on the outside. Acts 16, 26, what happens? And suddenly there was a great earthquake so that the foundations of the prison were shaken and immediately all the doors were open. Can you see the similarities happening from this in the tomb? Like the doors are falling off, the, the stone is being rolled away, everyone's bonds were being unfastened. The jailer's afraid. Jailer's responsible for keeping these people in and he's about to kill himself, but Paul and Silas you know, they're like, no, 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 wait, we're still all here, don't do anything. And this guy was about to kill himself because he knew that he was responsible. And if, if he didn't keep them in, he would find a fate that he was not going to be pleasantly you know, happy with. And so he was going to take care of the job himself. And they said, no, 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 we're still here. Paul stops him. And then he asks one of the most important questions in all of history. This is one of the most important questions you could ever ask. It's one of the most important questions you ever ask a friend you could ever ask uh, even to God, like as a prayer. And here it is. And he asks it in verse 30. Then he brought him out and he said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? This is one of the most important questions you could ever ask. And then Paul and Silas give them one of the most important answers that can ever be given. And they say, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. And so freedom happens from the inside out. But here's what I want you to understand. If you want to experience freedom, any measure of freedom today, no matter what is going on in your life, freedom requires surrender. See, they tell him something in this answer that maybe pushes back against everything he's ever known up to this point. Because up to this point, he may have put his faith in his government or in his employment or in you know, his hands of somebody else. Like, to, like up until this point, he thought, I mean, he, was, he had a big responsibility over his head. He may have put his, his trust in that until the very last moment. He's like, I, I'm out. I, I want to take my life because I, I can't handle this. He, he may have put his trust in his own self, his own way. Everything his culture told him, but here they tell him to do maybe the opposite of all of it, which is now place your faith in Jesus right now in this moment. Probably went against everything that he felt in that moment. Because in that moment, he just wanted out, right? But he had to surrender how he felt. Now, have you guys ever tried to make a major change in your life and not made it? <laughs> Anybody there? Let me just ask, how many of you guys are New Year's resolution people? Let's just see your hands, okay? Nobody wants to put up their hand in all the services we've done so far. Nobody really wants to put up your hand. Why? Because 92% or whatever the statistic is of us fail when we try to do that. Why is that? Well, we get to, you know, we, we get to Thanksgiving, we get through the holidays, and we've ate so much turkey and cake and pie and whatever it is that you guys eat, you know, and you get to January and you're looking in the mirror, you're like, I don't like the way I look. You know, I don't like the way, I don't like the way I feel. Like, I don't feel like I can do what I used to do. I feel horrible. I'm like filled with all of these whatever. And, you know, so we're like, I, I need to make a change. And so then in January, what happens? The gyms fill up for 17 and a half days. And and then, you know, all of that stuff happens, right? 
And so you get out there. I mean, you make a decision like I am going to get in shape because I don't like the way I feel. I don't like the way I look. And so day one, you're like, I have the tiger. You got that soundtrack running in your head. I mean, you're just rolling, right? And then day two comes along, you're still strong. Day three, you're still strong. Day four, you got an accountability partner, you're still strong. Day five, you're wavering, but you push through. Day six, you're still going. Day seven, you know, the, the snooze button is very, very tempting. Day eight, what happens? You hit the snooze button, right? And you stop working out that one day. I'll make up tomorrow, right? Why does that happen? Well, the reason why it happens most likely, the reason why it happens is because there's an ingredient in the mix that is sabotaging us, and there's a missing ingredient that we need that's not in the mix. See, what happens is we don't like the way we feel, and we don't like the way we look, and so because of that, that has motivated us to make a decision to change. But what happens is, as we go along, we get to about day seven or day eight of trying to make a change The feeling that motivated us to change is now replaced by a different feeling with just as strong of a motivation. And now the motivation to sleep, that feeling feels a whole lot better than any feeling I had seven days ago to change, right? Hey, you guys know what I'm talking about. And so the same happens like in your marriage. If you want to make a change in your marriage, like I don't like the way that this thing is going. I don't feel close. I don't feel like we're communicating well. I don't feel like I don't love you. Whatever it is. What happens is if you base your trying to change or trying to fix something on how you feel and you don't like how you feel and you want to feel better and so you start to try to make these changes to try to feel better, if it is based on feeling, what's going to happen? One day there will be somebody who makes you feel better that's not your spouse. And if our whole thing is based on how we feel, and if our whole motivation is based on how we feel, then guess what? One day, a different, there's always going to be a competing feeling that tries to compete with the good feeling or the feeling that was making you make a good change. There's always a bad feeling that's going to come and compete with the good feeling. And so that is sabotaging us. Well, what's missing? What's missing is truth. Because if you make a change by truth, I mean, the truth is something that doesn't change. The truth is the same yesterday, today, and forever. I don't care what the world says. Come on, somebody give me an amen. The truth is the same. It's the same yesterday, today. You can build your life upon it. But here's what, here's what the world's, I know this is contrary to popular thinking right now. Popular thinking says that to do whatever you feel. And then the world will, in, listen to me, the world inserts a lie that says that whatever you feel is truth. But here's where the problem is. The world promises that if you go by what you feel and live it as truth, that it will lead you to freedom. In fact, the very opposite happens. When you go by your feelings, it leads you into more bondage rather than than freedom. But if you build your life on the truth, what happens is it, it promises freedom and it delivers freedom, sets the captives free. And so you have to build, but you have to surrender your life to the truth. Because truth many times is believed before it's felt. And if you're waiting to feel the truth before you walk in the truth, you may never walk in the truth. I have people all the time come to me and like, well, you know, I feel this way or I think I was this way or, you know, I want to go this way or I I think that this is what the world says. Listen, here's what you have to understand. Every single one of us that comes to Jesus has to surrender something. Can I tell you what we have to surrender? Equally, all of us have to surrender 100% to Jesus. It doesn't matter how you feel. It doesn't matter what you perceive as truth. It doesn't matter what the world says is true. Every single one of us, is going to be different for every single one of us, but every single one of us, when I come to Jesus, I surrender who I am because he gets to now tell me who I am. That's called following Jesus. And by the way, the world doesn't understand that this is what it means to follow Jesus. But I'm telling you, what it means to follow Jesus is I trade my life in. And that's it. Like, I don't get to write the rules of who I am anymore. 
Jesus now writes the rules. The word of God writes the rules of who I am. So every single one of us, it's going to be different for every single one of us, but every single one of us has to surrender 100% of who we are to Jesus and allow him to fill in the blanks of who we now are. Otherwise, that's just called a religion. That's not called following Jesus. And so we have to surrender that to that. Now, some of us, we, we look at this guy, this jailer, and it's like, why give this guy a, a second shot? This guy was probably a bad guy. I mean, this guy's a guy that was probably in on beating up Paul and Silas. This guy was not, he was not on the good side, right? Have you ever wondered why, you know, it seems like bad people get the promotion? Have you ever wondered that? It's like, you got, how many of you guys have some people like that in your life? You're like, why is this bad person? I mean, they're doing all these things. Why does this, this happen? I've noticed, and maybe you have too, that grace seems unfair when it's given to anyone else but you. I mean, when I need grace, I'm like, please, give me grace. But how many times have I looked at someone else that I did not think deserved it and thought, why do they get a shot? I mean, come on, let them get what they have coming to them. Anybody else? Grace certainly seems unfair when given to anyone else but me. And we, we know that, okay, well, there's a bad person. And, of course, I'm a good person, right? But come on, if we're really honest, we know that's not true. We know that there's not just, like, all bad people and all good people. So what is it more like? Well, it's more like a sliding scale, right? So can you just imagine with me, imagination, this side of the stage over here, just imagine like a timeline scale. This is extreme bad over here. And then you stretch it all the way over to here, and this over here would be extreme good. Now, start putting people you know on this scale. How many of you guys got some dots up there right now? You're like, okay, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah I'm going to see them this afternoon. Like, no. Now, put yourself as best you can on this scale. I know you're over here. I know you're over here. But where are you over here? So you're over. And, and even this, like, we, we know that we can't put people in good and bad boxes and the extreme scale. Even this is relative. Because the question is, how do you know where to put yourself on this? I can tell you how you, you probably came to a conclusion. Most of us came to a conclusion, we're probably right here. Were you over here? I don't know where you were at. You're right in here somewhere, and you came to this conclusion most likely because of comparison. I'm not as bad as those people, but I'm not as good as that person, so I must be here. I mean, they give more money than I do. They serve more people. They're more generous than, so I can't be over there but I am certainly not like that person. So I must be here. You see, all comparison is, is comparing sins. And no good comes from comparing sins. But that's how we, we end up and we arrive at this place. And here's the temptation that happens. When you look at life this way, Here's, what, here's what's next. Even for those of us who have said, I'm 100% in following Jesus, I follow Jesus, here's the temptation. When you look at it this way and you place yourself on this scale, the temptation is to think maybe somehow if I do just a little bit more, I could go a few notches up. Maybe if I worked a little harder, maybe if I did a little more, maybe if I... I served a little more, maybe if I was a little more generous, maybe if I read my Bible more, even those of us who are following Jesus, then maybe I could push the limits a little bit further. But can I tell you that God doesn't see in boxes of good and bad? God doesn't even see on a scale of good and bad. God sees in terms of dead or alive on the inside. So it doesn't matter. If you are not alive spiritually on the inside, it doesn't matter where you are. Because how many of you guys have met people who don't follow Jesus that are on the extremely good side? Like, you'd have to put them over here. You couldn't not put them over here. But the question isn't, are you extremely good? The question is, are you dead or alive spiritually on the inside? Because even if you're not alive spiritually, this whole scale, no matter where you are, it fits over into the dead box until something happens on the inside and you become alive 
spiritually, and you say to Jesus, I am all in. Here's my life. Now tell me how I'm to live. Now tell me who I am. All of it's dead until you have that moment. God doesn't see in, in terms of good and bad. He sees in terms of dead or alive. And if you are going to experience freedom in your life, if you're going to be a follower of Jesus, I want you to understand you are going to have to surrender the idea that somehow you can be good enough to follow Jesus. And you're going to have to accept the idea that Jesus is your enough. You're going to have to surrender the idea that I get to make up my own rules of good and bad and that that's good enough. You're going to have to surrender it to Jesus Christ and say, no, Jesus is, is who I follow and, and that's it, right? He tells me. And so what do we do about this? Like, what do we do about this whole story of, of Jesus, you know, dying on the cross and all this? How do, we, how do we handle this? Well, one more quick video reminds us of what he's done for us, but then also gives us a little bit of an answer as to what to do next. Take a quick look. We can only respond to this. How do we respond, though? Matthew chapter 16, verse 24. Then Jesus told his disciples, if anyone would come after me, if there's anyone here today that wants to follow Jesus, let him deny himself. Take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. If you want to know the answer to that, what must I do to be saved? He's saying you have to lose your life in order to save it. But whoever does lose his life, for my sake, will find it. What will it profit a man if he gains the whole world, if you go the whole world's way? But at the end of it, you find out that you are in the dead category and that you haven't been following Jesus. What will it profit if you gain the whole world, but you forfeit your soul? Or what will man give in return for his soul? How do we respond to this, this freedom that happens on the inside, this freedom that we have to surrender to? Here, here's how we can participate in it. Freedom, if you want to experience salvation, if you want to experience freedom, freedom is transferred, not earned. You want to save your life, you lose it. You lose your life to save it. There's a transfer that happens. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21 says, for, this, this scripture is very dense, but it has a lot to it. It says, for our sake, he made him, that's the Father, made Jesus to be sin who knew no sin. Jesus was perfect and blameless. He was the perfect, spotless lamb of God, the scripture calls him. Referencing the Old Testament 
sacrificial system where they'd bring a perfect, blameless, spotless lamb to, to, as a payment for sin. But it says that he knew no sin. But in the moment on the cross, all of the sin, all of our sin was placed upon him even though he was blameless and sinless. So our sin was now transferred over to Jesus so that in him we might become the righteousness of God so that his righteousness, his right standing before, the God, before God in perfection was now a transfer over to us. The only way that can happen is the grace of God. You can't earn that, right? You can't work for that. If you earn it or work for it, it's no longer grace. Grace is a gift. The, the word the grace in Greek means charis. It's a gift. It means a free gift. Anybody like free things? Anybody like free stuff? Yeah. Anybody want something free today? Anybody want something free today? All right. Chris, I'm gonna, I saw your hand go up first. Chris, come on up here. I've got something for you. I really do have something for you. Come on. No, come on up on the stage here. Give her a big hand as she comes on up. I have Buffalo Wild Wing gift card. Now, how many you guys know the service just got a whole lot better, right? All right. Buffalo Wild Wing. This is actual real. Okay, this is, this is not, not, I'm not playing with you. Yeah, this is actually real. It's a $25 gift card to Buffalo Wild Wings. Come on, somebody praise Jesus, Lamb of God. So I'm going to give this to you. It's $25. Do you have $25 on you, though? In your purse. In your purse, Okay. Uh, Megan, reach back. No. Uh, all right. So, all right. So it's down there. We're not going to do that. Do you, do you have, um, do you have anything of value on you that you could trade me for this? Then a wedding ring? watch. Okay. Uh, that's, that's nice. What do you think the value of that is? I'd more t- than 20. More than 20. Okay. <laughs> all right. So money's out. The watch you're not going to give me, but okay. I still want to give this to you, but you know, after this service, uh, and in between, you know, we got another service coming on, and then in between, like at the end of it, all these people are going to leave coffee cups and trash. They do it every single week. Trust me, and they, they do it. They, they, so you know, and then the the on the other side of that wall, I don't know if you know, but there are babies that create things. We call them diapers. And um, if you could just stay around for a couple hours, I would love to give this. And if you could just clean all that up, I'd love to give. To, yes. Okay. So, all right. So if I have Chris. Give me $25 for this gift card. What is that? That's a payment, right? If I have her trade something of value for that, that's, we're bartering at this point, right? If I have her sit around, you know, stay around and work for it, that's a job, right? It's no longer a free gift. We all understand this like in normal life. If, but I really want to give this. I'm going to give that to you. That is now yours. Now, I want you to understand that that is not church money. That's my money, okay? I bought that with my own money, okay? And I'm giving that to you, and it's free for you. But it wasn't free for me. Right. You paid. Because it cost me something. Can you guys see where I'm going with this? Amen. That the grace of God is free for us, but it costs Jesus something. Amen. It costs him everything. Amen. Can you give Chris a big hand? That oh. is actually yours. The grace of God is a free gift. And the only way you receive the free gift is through a transfer. You cannot pay for it by your good works. You cannot earn it. You cannot barter for it. You cannot work for it. You can't do any of those things for it. You simply receive it as you surrender because there's an exchange happening. When you give Jesus, when you really give Jesus your life, and you say, I am surrendering my way, which is most likely surrendering the world's way of thinking, I surrender the world's way of thinking for God's truth. I surrender my life to get God's grace. I surrender my sin in a transfer to receive God's grace. When you do that, it's like, why would God set up a system where it's like innocent blood is shed for a guilty person? Why would God set up a system? I can tell you why God would set up a system like that. It's because God is not fair. How many of you guys are thankful that God's not fair? Because if I got what I deserved, I would deserve destruction. But God is a God. Grace is not fair. Grace is not fair. I love this, this quote. I heard it a long time ago, but it says, the moment you bow your knee to the lordship of Jesus Christ, 
All of your sin is now transferred to Christ's account and paid in full. It was nailed to the cross 2,000 years ago, but that's only half the gospel. Because mercy is not getting what you deserve. So if you, mercy is when the grace of, when the mercy of God comes and withholds something that was coming to you. That's mercy. That's the, you know, withholding the wrath of God. Grace is, is getting something that you don't deserve. It's that free gift that you get, the righteousness of Christ. So everything you've done, everything you've done wrong is forgiven and forgotten, and everything Christ did right, his righteousness is transferred to your account, and then God calls it even. That's the good news of the gospel. That's the good news that we're talking about today. And so when the, in the Old Testament, when they would bring a perfect, spotless lamb, the, the priest who would be there to inspect it, I want you to hear me, he would inspect the lamb, not the lamb bringer. And when we come before the Father, we have the perfect lamb of God. And when the Father sees us, he sees us through the perfection of Jesus Christ. But that only happens through a transfer. And so as the worship team comes up and we're getting ready to, to wrap this up, I want you to understand that you have met Jesus already <laughs> on your best and worst day, your best and worst moment. And when you met Jesus, sin is no longer the problem. Sin was the problem, but you have a decision to make, a choice to make. What are you going to do? How are you going to respond? Because what I... I'm asking you to do in the moments that we have left is simply ask yourself a question. Not are you good or bad. Not are you extremely bad or where you are on the scale. What I'm asking you is are you really dead or alive on the inside? Has that transfer of your sin been transferred over to Jesus and Jesus' righteousness been transferred over to you by his grace? Have you really decided to follow Jesus all in or are we holding something back? Because John 14, 6 says this. Jesus said, he said, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. No one comes to God through any other way. You don't get to come through worldly way. You don't get to come through the path of religion. You don't get to come through your version of following Jesus. You come through Jesus as the way the truth, the unchanging truth, and the life. And no one, don't think you're going to be the exception, no one comes to God except through the path of Jesus. And he came to give you grace and truth, freedom and truth. He does this by your grace. And what I want you to understand is that whatever tomb you find yourself in this morning, that Jesus can bring you freedom, but you have to respond. Would you take just a moment and bow your heads and close your eyes? Can we just do this just to shut out distractions for just, just a couple minutes here, just a brief moment? You're already here, so maybe it's time just to do some real business with God. And ask yourself this question, am I dead or alive on the inside? Have I said yes to following Jesus or am I really following my own way? I don't, it doesn't matter if you're a religious person. What matters is if you've really said yes to Jesus. Because Jesus died on the cross. He took our place. He took our sin. He offers us grace as he went to the tomb. Chains were falling off. Captives were being set free. He rose from the dead. He's alive today and he offers us this life, but he does it through his grace and there has to be a surrender to get the transfer. And I just want to give you an opportunity this morning to come to a point of decision. What will you do with Jesus? I, I'm not trying to hype you into anything. I'm not trying to sell you something. I'm, I just feel an obligation to plead with you to come to a point of decision. And if you're here today and you say, Pastor Sean, I, I don't really know, or maybe you do know, 
but you know that you're not right with God and you need to be right. You need to say yes to following him. Would you just take, I mean, I know we have no, nobody looking around, all that kind of stuff. This is really just a moment for you and God, but I, I think there's something significant about even in a moment like this that you do some action that's, that's acknowledging. So would you just, if that's you, you say, count me in. I need to make a decision. I need to build my life on truth. I need to follow Jesus. Would you just lift up your hand just as an action of faith right there? If you can't do this now, you're not gonna be able to stand in the hard times. All right, hands all over the building. What we're gonna do right now is we're just responding to what God is, is doing. The Bible says, believe in your heart, confess with your mouth. We're going to pray a prayer. And there's not magic words in these prayer, this prayer. It's, it's not about that. We're just marking this moment. You know, there's power in our words. We're marking this moment. And so I'm gonna ask everybody to pray with us, but we're just gonna confess what's happening on the inside. And let me help you with these words. So would you all pray with me? Say, Lord Jesus, I confess that I'm a sinner and I need you to save me. I believe that you died on the cross for me, that you took my sin, you took my place. I turn from my old life and I choose to live for you. I receive your grace by faith in the name of Jesus. Lord, I pray for all those who raised their hand across the room today. Maybe those watching right now, even online. I pray right now by revelation of your spirit, maybe they don't even know how to put words to this, but somehow that by the revelation of your spirit, you would help them to understand that they are now a brand new person. That on the inside, the outside may not have changed just yet, but on the inside, they have gone from death to life. They've gone from darkness to light, that they have brand new spiritual DNA on the inside, that they are brand new creations. And I pray that they would understand that things are brand new right now on the inside. And Lord, we thank you that we can experience victory in our life because of your victory. And that we can walk in this newness of life. Would you guys stand up with me? It's such a powerful moment. I don't want to necessarily break the spirit of what's happening here, but I do want to talk to you guys. Those of you guys who did raise your hand, you know who you are. Next week, we are doing something very special that is just, as actually for you. Because the Bible tells, there's, there's a couple signposts of living this new life. And one of them is something we call baptism. Baptism is painting a picture on the outside of what's just happened to you on the inside. We take you under the water, which represents your old life being gone, and we bring you out of the water, which represents new life. This is what the scripture commands us to do. And so we, we're doing that next week, and you can sign up, and we could do that next week. Like, we can get you right in. And there's something very, very powerful about publicly saying, I said yes to follow Jesus. So please take that opportunity. Next week, we're going to be doing that. And the second signpost of, in, of being in the kingdom is something we call communion. And we have tables in front and tables in the back. And this is a moment that Jesus initiated. It actually goes way back thousands of years before that with the Passover. But Jesus, at the Last Supper, he said, do this in remembrance of me. And so we take the juice that represents his blood that was spilled on the cross and the, the cracker which represents his body that was broken for us and we take a moment and we remind ourselves of his sacrifice, of that transfer, and then also of his victory. And so we're gonna do that here at the end and here's how we're gonna do it. During this brief song, you're gonna come and grab the elements, take them back to your seat, hang on to them, and I'm gonna come right back and then we're going to, I'm, I'm gonna walk you through, we'll lead you through it together. Let me pray, Lord, we thank you so much for your grace. I pray that you would help us to have an even deeper revelation of it as we walk out of this place than when we walked in. And as we come to the table and we prepare our hearts to receive communion, be with us by your spirit even in this time in a special way in Jesus' name, amen. Grab the elements, take them back to your seats, hang on to them. You know, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23 says, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, 
on the night when he was betrayed, he took bread. And when he'd given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. He, his body was broken for us. You know, there's so much that we could say about what happened on the cross and all the things, the seven sayings of Jesus and, you know, the scriptures that are prophesied and the, you know, the stripes on his back and healing and all of that type of stuff. And, and all of that is wrapped up in a moment like this. The, the most important thing is just to remember that he gave his life for you. I know he gave his life for us, but he also gave his life for you. So keep that in your mind as you receive this. Let's receive it. Take the cup. In the same way, he also took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. This represents the blood of Jesus. Most precious substance ever known to man. Most precious substance that ever hit the earth is the blood of our Savior. And so we remind ourselves of that as we receive this and we're thankful for his blood that there's life in the blood of Jesus and the blood of Jesus washes away our sins. And so, Spirit of God, would you be with us in this moment as we receive this, not just in a symbolic way, but in a powerful way that your presence comes and is with us in this moment, reminds us supernaturally of your sacrifice for us. And we thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's receive. Would you stand with me as we come out of this time and let's just worship God one more time as we get ready to close. Let's just give God all of our worship. If you've held anything back up to this point, now's the time to leave it all in the field. Let's worship Him.